The world record for insomnia for total sleeplessness is held by one Randy Gardner. He set the record back in the 60s when he was a high school student. He was a self-described science fair geek. He beat the previous record of time without sleep, which was eight and a half days. That record was held by some DJ from New York. Randy's record, his story was documented scientifically by a researcher from Stanford. He stayed awake for 11 days. 11. That's it. That's the official world record. This story is about a 12-year-old genius. named Dickie Van Kesterson Watts. Dickie has been awake for 42 straight days and nights. He reads great works of literature by flashlight. He gazes at the stars and lights off fireworks. Dickie's father, Henry Van Kesterson Watts, used to be a writer, a novelist, but he doesn't write anymore. All his father does now is drink on a very regular basis. He's a neglectful, absentee parent, and as a result, Dickie has to take care of himself. He also takes care of his vegetable and herb garden, and he takes care of his father. Today is an important day for Dickie, and he needs his dad to be present. All right, old man. Have some respect for yourself. Pull up your pants. Did you piss yourself again? Ah, don't touch. Mm. Jesus flying Christ, Dad. Pull your pants up. Look at yourself. This is my number one guy. My right hand. I should call him Sir. Mm. Sir John Gilgood. You don't smell like urine. Just cigarettes and alcohol. My color of choice, so boy. Oh, day retreatism. How long can you keep this up? <laughs> You're a disaster. I'm not a disaster at all. I'm just in the middle of a personal paradigm shift. From intoxication to delirium tremens. Are you really gonna start this crap with me, Dickie? It's entirely too late in the day. It's early in the morning. You should clean up. Don't. Tell me what to do, Dickie. I don't ever tell you what to do. Well, maybe you should. I'm a fucking child. You can take care of yourself, Dickie. Yeah, well, you can't. And I'm not going to be around forever. There's instant coffee on the table. Aspirin, too. I poured you a small scotch as well to get you started. Importantly, don't forget, meeting at the 
school today at 2 p.m. with Mr. Phillips, my counselor, about my my future. Now, have this scotch. By all means, take the edge off. But stay sober enough for 2 o'clock. Very important to me. Very sticky. <coughs> P.S. I lifted some paper from school for your typewriter. School for your typewriter. If it still even works. There exists some documentation about this Taiwanese Buddhist who stays awake for three months at a time. It has something to do with cleansing, something to do with spiritual practice, getting closer to God or something. His smile does seem genuine though. Maybe he's on to something. That kid is so little, right? He's like seven years old or something. Total freaking genius. He's in my AP calculus class and he's like smarter than the teacher. Weird? Totally. He's graduating next year and like gonna work for NASA or something. Class, today we begin our study on the celebrated novel, Aristotle's Mistake, A Love Story. The author is Henry Van Kesterson Watts, and this is the only novel he's ever published. Your assignment was to read chapters one and two of the accompanying text. The information regarding the Elizabethan England and Aristotelian ethic will put perspective on everything. You are also to read the first four chapters of Mistake. Dickie. Would you like to say a few words before we begin our lecture? No. Why would I? Well, Dickie, he's your father. I thought you could provide us with some special insight. I didn't do the assignment. I didn't do the reading. I've never even read the book. Oh? Not oh, no. I have a hall pass. I need to go see my guidance counselor. Angie, is Dickie out there? Good. Um, his dad? Okay, well, tell him no skateboarding, please. Thank you. Never mind, just send him in. Thank you. Did <clears throat> my dad call? No, not yet. Um, maybe he's on his way. Yeah, on his way to getting pickled. Fuck him. Watch your mouth. And another thing, how many times do I gotta tell you? There is no skateboarding in this school. You and I both know that's an out-and-out -out lie, Gary. There is skateboarding in the school. I do it all the time. You know what I mean. Don't pick my English apart. Verboten? And another thing. You need to call me Mr. Phillips, 
my name is Mr. Phillips. Have a little bit of respect. Sure thing, Gary. So I got good news and bad news. You want to hear the bad first? Sure. Okay. The bad news is that you will never again skateboard in this school. And the good news is that you'll be skateboarding in Maryland. You want it. You got it. You won the Humboldt Scholarship. Uh, out of 1,500 applicants, they said your test scores were unprecedented. Cool. Other than no, I accept. It's not that easy. That's, that's why I wanted you to, to be here with your dad. There is nothing to discuss with him. I'll get him to sign whatever needs to be signed. Baltimore, Maryland should be far enough away, I guess. There are rumors of an 88-year-old woman who sat in a rocking chair smoking cigarettes for 20 days without sleep. She began hallucinating after day four. As this story begins, little does Dickie know, but there are two other insomniacs in town, two individuals who, on the surface, share nothing in common with Dickie, except for a shared inability to sleep. Like Dicky, though, they've been spending their nights alone. They do what they can to pass the time. They do whatever they can to combat the restlessness in their hearts and minds. This is Ava Cole. She is an insomniac. Ava usually spends most of her nights alone painting. She paints in a rooftop fort that her father and younger brother, now both dead, had built some years before. There used to be a no girls allowed policy. Ava stopped sleeping when she lost her loved ones. When she paints, she doesn't use traditional light sources, just candlelight, moonlight, and shadow. As a result, her compositions turn out somewhat haunted or troubled, but inarguably beautiful. Ava received a full scholarship to a reputable college of art and design, but was unable to go away due to the untimely death of her father and brother. Instead, she stayed at home with her mother, who is, by all accounts, catatonic. Her mother, Bridget, lives in a universe of abject denial, and as a result, Ava must inhabit the same world. It's a world of unresolved grief, a world where nothing can move forward. 
everything must stay the same. So Ava paints, and she smokes marijuana, she self-medicates. Ava is lonely like all insomniacs are. Some people have talked about this woman, this woman whose mother died. After that, this woman couldn't, wouldn't go to sleep. You see, she was afraid of having nightmares about her dead mother. She didn't sleep for eight years. This is Henry, Dr. Henry DeForte. Not a medical doctor, an academic doctor. Henry is an insomniac. Somewhere along the line, he mysteriously lost peace of mind. Henry had a perfect life. He had a wonderful job as a professor of literature at a prestigious university. He had a beautiful fiance, wonderful friends, and a loving family. Without warning or explanation, he recently quit them all, dropped out of his life. Even though on the surface, Henry's life was perfect and should have been without complaint, he was missing one thing, arguably the most important thing a soul needs, purpose. Standing Babas, these batshit crazy people in India, these sadhus. These dudes have been standing for decades, seriously, decades. Once again, it has something to do with spiritual practice and godliness. These holy men never sit or lay down, don't sleep. They have supposedly been awake since before the JFK assassination. Dickie sometimes wanders through the local cemetery. He visits his mother who is buried there. It gives him a little peace to be surrounded by those who are gone. You see, he has trouble relating to most people here on Earth. But Dickie could relate to Ava. Ava also spends time in the local cemetery. She visits her brother and her father who are also buried here. She gets some comfort from their ghosts. She also has trouble relating to most people above ground, but she would relate to Dickie. And to Henry. Henry comes to the cemetery as well. He has no loved ones buried here, but feels at home surrounded by the anonymous graves all the same. Henry is more than half dead inside, you see. He can't relate to anyone anymore, but he should be able to relate to Dickie and to Ava. There are invisible threads, hidden similarities that magically, beautifully, gracefully connect us all together. The human condition, the human experience is not an individual affair. It is a collective group dynamic. All it takes is to open your eyes to the invisible threads between us and then no one can ever be alone again. Maybe they can help each other to sleep. If they do meet, it's going to take these things for their story to have a happy ending. A woman's gold watch, a piano, Elvis sunglasses, 
antique china, an Enfield motorcycle, alarm clocks, two romance novels, an urban rickshaw, whiskey, a blue Miata and a white Jetta, two cats named Cheryl and Barbara, a millipede, poker chips, a hummingbird, a diner, a waitress at a diner, some warm milk, marijuana, fresh fruit, piggy banks, a second-hand suit, an aqua-colored Volkswagen a raspberry pie, an exploded appendix, ice cream sundaes, a dive bar, Japanese slippers, pinatas, a shotgun and pistols, a story about a lighthouse and a boy in a wheelchair, elaborate breakfasts, an antique typewriter, a go-kart, walkie-talkies, a bowling trophy, a large stack of cash, a grappling hook, more fireworks, one last sunrise, and strange and beautiful music. No forgiveness and empathy. 